Good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you here, and we're going to go right into our meeting. We will, we've called to order our meeting, and we're going to first do our strategic planning. We're going to ask Mr. Gent if he will give us a, a summary of those items. Thank you, Madam Chair. Today, um, we'll have a busy day. We're going to have a couple of presentations. The first presentation will be by Mr. Crawford, and we'll talk about legislative uh, agendas, FSBA, um, and the consortium that we belong to as well. Then we'll be followed up with Bill Tomlinson on uh, an update on what we're going to be doing in our schools to comply with the state um, legislation on mental health needs, followed by uh, Dr. Prince and, um, and uh, Brian Ruther on uh, school safety. And then if time permits, Helen will do a brief um, about ELA regarding our K-3 plan. If we don't have time for that, then she'll come back and do that in August. And then we need about a 10-minute executive session. Is that enough for everybody? Okay. We're good? Okay. I've been in meetings all day. So, <laughs> All right. So, uh, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Madam Chair, members of the board, it's a, always a pleasure to be here. I want you to know that I am officially half of the walking wounded uh, representing you in Tallahassee. Uh, Nicole Fogarty was going to try to be here, but she too had foot surgery last week uh, and is recovering. So hopefully by the time we get through with you, it's rough in Tallahassee, I'll just tell you that. But hopefully by the time we get through in Tallahassee, or get through uh, the, the election season, we'll be both uh, healthy and back to normal. But uh, I do appreciate being here. I think at our last uh, session discussing legislation, uh, it was suggested to you, and I would like to still recommend to you, uh, that we do the 2019 issues in sort of a two-part basis. Uh, part one is today. Uh, part one is to look at uh, any issues that you would like to submit to the Florida School Boards Association, which is not already part of their plan uh, or recommended platform. Uh, those recommendations are due Friday, which is why we requested to have this discussion now. Uh, secondly is the Greater Florida Consortium with Ms. Hawley as president of that organization. Um, I believe you're looking at uh, that meeting somewhere around the first part of October, which probably would mean that the recommendations to the consortium would be more or less in the first 10 days of September. Uh, and I would like to suggest that what we do come up with today uh, serve that dual purpose, both for submission to FSBA and to the consortium. Uh, part two would be uh, coming back in December and probably doing what I'm going to euphemistically call the real program. Uh, but that will be after election, after we've had a chance to see what happens with the constitutional amendments, more importantly, especially the gubernatorial race. Uh, and uh, uh, as we get closer to the opening of session on March 5, be able to hone in on those issues that are really of, of importance to uh, St. Lucie, knowing at, by that point where we are with the other state organizations. So uh, if that sort of general timeline uh, fits with you, uh, we'd like to sort of pursue on that basis, if that's okay. And, and the meeting, uh, either if we could do it at a, at a meeting in uh, December uh, or the very first part of January, because I know the committee hearings will probably get underway by about the second week of January. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that we have something uh, that uh, you can present to the delegation. And I'm not sure yet when they're going to meet. Uh, and I would anticipate probably uh, December. I had, uh, working with uh, the superintendent, um, you had a couple of documents uh, to take a look at over the uh, last several days, one of which was our preliminary recommendations from last October uh, that covered funding as well as uh, assessment uh, areas, and uh, we looked at that accountability and school options. Uh, the other is the current working legislative platform of the Florida School Boards Association where uh, they have in there uh, specific issues about student performance. Uh, they, I believe the issue about retaining the two mills is currently in there. And then the third sheet that was on, online, uh, there's some ideas to take a look at if you wanted to uh, consider these uh, for recommendations for next year. Uh, these came out largely of the legislative committee meeting at FSBA last uh, June. And uh, uh, I'm, if you don't mind, I'd sort of like to kick it off because one that I know is probably on the mind 
mind of everyone. Certainly, I believe that uh, uh, Mr. Jen had meetings this morning. You've got discussion later on this afternoon as in the issue of school safety. Um, the legislature in 2018, uh, when they passed the Safe Schools legislation, essentially created three pots of money, if you will. Uh, the first is the continuation of the present uh, $64 million that was to provide not only for resource officers but for a number of other activities, uh, 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 anti-bullying, et cetera. The second pot of money was for additional school resource officers, and the third was if the district and if the sheriff wanted to do this and if employees wanted to participate was the so-called guardian program. Uh, as time has evolved, and this I know was discussed partly in June, uh, we still are expecting that there will be a discussion by what is called the Joint Legislative Budget Commission. That's the joint committee that is by, uh, between the House and the Senate. They have authority to make budget amendments during the year. One of those that has been that will be before them is to allow uh, districts who have uh, exceeded or exceeding their expenditures on school resource officers to potentially uh, use any leftover funds from the Guardian program. Uh, the legislature right at this point and the governor are waiting to get the final numbers in uh, as districts, as you are well aware, are still making their plans for uh, the opening of school. But uh, by the opening of school, that sh should be pretty well known. Uh, and we would expect to see the LBC take this up uh, so that for this coming year, be able to uh, uh, make any, any changes and provide some additional dollars for those districts that still need and still prefer uh, to go the uh, school resource officer route. The splitting up the funds this past year was to guarantee that there would be no duplication and to guarantee that there would be at least one law enforcement officer per school. Uh, that, it, if you carry that into 2019-20, uh, probably is not necessary because everybody should have by that point one officer per school. And the, the uh, uh, suggestion is to collapse those three different pots of money back into one source which would still maintain the obligation of uh, law enforcement on each campus, but again, give districts the flexibility uh, as to how they spend uh, dollars after they've met that need on other programs, uh, rather than having to deal with three tiers, if you will, of uh, funding. So uh, that's one I think that I've been hearing uh, uh, as being a suggestion, at least to make that permanent in statute uh, and coming forth with the 29, uh, I'm sorry, the 19, uh, 2019 uh, 20 uh, legislative session the school year. Mr. Jen, do you want to add on that? Just a question. Do they feel that the money that's allocated now is enough to have an officer in every school, a school resource deputy? In the, in the allocation that was set aside specifically for school resource officers, it was, uh, uh, I'm going to say it was probably a, a, a sort of a swag uh, a guess that was made uh, to try to provide for one for each school. Uh, statewide, from what I'm hearing, it is not enough funds at this point. Uh, and at the same time, the Sheriff's Association, uh, and this is probably about a month and a half ago, two months ago, uh, the Sheriff's Association statewide has said that for the dollar that were set aside for the Guardian program that they would probably not be able to spend perhaps even half of that. So there is expected to be a surplus left over for, from the Guardian uh, category that could be uh, changed over. And again, for this current coming year, uh, that's where the uh, Legislative Budget Commission would come into play. I made a statement today, and I want to make sure it was accurate, that the governor's initial proposal, well, it was the governor's proposal, not the legislator's, wasn't um, an SRO in, on, in every school, as well as then of over 1,000, two SROs. That's correct. But then the legislature went a different way. So I think we have to really look closely at, is it adequate funding? Because we're, you know, it's squeezing not only the schools, but it's squeezing the, um, the local municipalities who have the same issues that we have of budgetary constraints and no local control and lack of flexibility. And I just think that that's going to be something that we need to really push that, it, you know, I think we would prefer a school resource deputy in every school as opposed to a hybrid uh, approach that's out there um, since we're dealing with lives. We can talk more about it. And I don't know if the board has any comments. Okay. All right. That's generally, I think, been the consensus uh, 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 statewide. Uh, there are obviously places in Florida where, and I'll now go back up to the north part of the state, uh, there are more schools than there are sheriff's deputies. 
uh, and in a number of places there it makes sense perhaps to to look at the guardian model uh, there are other places that uh, uh, the district does like the guardian model uh, but uh, I'm not seeing anybody go purely for that as if anything it's a hybrid and the preference has been still to have a fully trained uh, local law enforcement officer uh, uh, on campus it was just to make keep it simple like the governor's was simple you got one in every you know find one almost a tiered approach uh as opposed to what's in there now and I, and I, and, I, and you mentioned other districts are struggling i'm sure from what i'm reading you know and and all the media outlets that i look at every day you know every a lot of us are um, struggling with that okay I would anticipate that, uh, frankly, through either the uh, State Superintendents Association or through FSBA, uh, and I'm going to make a very, uh, probably a pretty accurate guess, that by December uh, there will have been a request for data uh, by district in terms of what the expenses are versus the revenues. Uh, a lot of counties are having to come up with their own local funds. Uh, I know at least in uh, a couple of situations, including immediately south of here, uh, that happens to be a topic for a referendum uh, to help uh, cover those costs, and uh, by December we'll pretty much know whether the, even the current appropriation is enough but right at this point I think the issue is to try to give districts the flexibility uh, and, and and remove the the restrictions that you have on these three-tiered uh, approach so that would suggest to toss that out if you are if you are interested in uh, uh, that is an issue here uh, we can certainly submit that to uh, FSBA or the Greater Florida Consortium if not we'll be glad to move on to other topics Chair issue here and we would like for you to definitely move on with that before and take it further for us okay and uh, Miss Hensley do we have preliminary data yet uh, for the different counties I mean I've talked heard from several school board members that they're having some difficulty figuring out how they're going to work with the municipalities or their sheriff and this all over the place in the state do we have any preliminary data yet we have nothing statewide what we do have are the ancillary stories that are coming out uh, newspapers whether it's on the west coast or here on the east coast or up north uh, and uh, I know that there are still a number of counties that have had issues I think they're getting closer uh, in many situations I'm finding where uh, the district is for the time being uh, has an agreement for the sheriff's office to help out in return for a, a, a one plus year transition uh, to more of a, of a resource officer kind of basis. Uh, that I'm hearing it coming across a number of times. But uh, uh, I would expect, again, by December, we'll probably will have that. Certainly by the time we get through a budget adoption uh, in September, it might be clearer by that point as well. Anyone else have any comments, any discussion? I'm just curious, like Palm Beach County has their own fairly large security system. Right. How does it work with their funding? Well, I mean, for the school system. I know Mr. Jenkins speak with that, but I know in Palm Beach, uh, they have self-funded their school police department for quite some time. Uh, they were one of originally three that goes back to about 1981. I passed the local act that dealt with that. Uh, but there's, I think, six counties right now that have their own duly authorized police department. You've got some other counties that have a, a, a security department, if you will, or a safety department, uh, and they hire their own SROs. Uh, that's certainly one option. Sarasota, I believe, is one that is looking now creating their own department, but they can't get it up and running for another year, so they're working with the sheriff in a transition period. So those are the kinds of things that are going on. So I'm asking, will they get the same, they won't get the funding that our county, that other counties will they, get, They get correct? the same funding. The thing they is do? that they've been spending a lot more than what they receive from the state. Uh, if I, if I, I don't mean to speak out of turn, but I believe Palm Beach has been spending something in the neighborhood of about 15 to $16 million a year. Uh, and in return, they get about $5 million from the state, which actually hasn't gone to that. It's gone to uh, uh, their, their other safe schools programs. Uh, at least I know that was when Mr. Gent was superintendent, that was the situation. Uh, the money they're getting now for the SROs that they've applied for will be to help hire additional officers. Um, actually, I th I'll take that back. They've got agreements with, I think, a number of municipalities and the uh, sheriff's office to provide officers uh, while they look at trying to still recruit officers for the following year. That's a big issue, is, is, the, is the recruitment issue, and that's why some counties are, are looking at doing the hybrid with the Guardian uh, program at this point. So we have the safe schools issue. Um, I'm, I'm literally, I've got a blank sheet here. This is uh, your agenda. 
Uh, but uh, I didn't know if, if you wanted to look at things that we had from uh, this past year in terms of priorities. Uh, wanted to look at submitting. Uh, I can I can just I, I give you some thoughts of, of what is, is I'm hearing around the state that people are looking at. Um, there seems to be interest uh, in uh, uh, allowing people to come back into the classroom or teaching or bu driving buses quicker than is currently allowed after retirement. Uh, that's uh, one. Another is potentially easing uh, certification requirements to be able to get more business uh, individuals into the classroom, like for career academies. Uh, there's uh, still some discussion about trying to adjust the assessment uh, system. Uh, that may be one, something we want to look at a little more when we talk in December, early January, uh, depending upon the, uh, who's governor, because we will also have a new education commissioner starting in January, uh, and that might be a topic more appropriate for that point. Uh, um, and then, of course, the issue of uh, FEFP funding, where uh, yes, it did increase $400 million, and yes, there was more than $100 million that went into the base allocation, which still worked out to $0.47 cents per student. Um, so uh, you may want to look at uh, uh, having a, a statement on FEFP funding if you wish. Uh, I'll just uh, throw these out. We've been asking for years for the extra 0.25 with flexibility. Last year, the School Board Association Legislative Committee, we tied that to increase safety and security, including hurricane preparedness and public safety. Um, I really think that that needs to be on there. We will carry that to the state, but uh, that needs to be on there. That impacts not just our county, that impacts many, many counties. And uh, it is something we've been working for for so many years. I hate to have that not on there. That is currently in the draft FSBA program, so we would not need to submit that. But I would suggest that you may want to uh, have that as a recommendation for the consortium. And uh, you, you mentioned the 0.25 mills. You mean 0.25 or you mean 0.5? Point 0.5, but I'd like to be able to at least collect the 0.25 <coughs> we already passed by 62% by in this county. But <laughs> okay. Another topic uh, that uh, uh, certainly would be of, uh, of interest is on the calculating the required local effort. You may remember it was frozen this past year for this coming year. They did allow growth and uh, construction to go back into the calculation of required effort. Uh, there's still a desire in some other places to try to get the, re the constitutionally allowed uh, reassessments and to restore uh, growth of RLE as it had been. And I don't know if that's of any uh, interest to you right at this point. However we decide or how the consortium decides or the Florida School Board Association about this Amendment 8, there, I would say the average person doesn't understand what, because they've wrapped this in such a way with civics education and in talking to people, their, their response is, well, we should be teaching civics in school, but this is so really incredibly done in such a way that it confuses the public that I hope that the consortium in connection with the school system will create something to send out so that the average voter understands this isn't about civics education. This is about the public school system losing control of a private school system that looks like a public school system. <laughs> it's very confusing, and if I'm confused, I know the average voter and the way to present that. I hope that we have a vehicle and a way to present this to voters. This is important, and we need to get on it quickly, I would say, before you know, November. Chair, uh, League of Women Voters actually has put that together. It just came out at the end of last week, I believe. Uh, we'll have a PowerPoint and all the talking points, and actually the State League of Women Voters has filed suit over that particular issue. And uh, so they're asking for an expedited hearing before the Supreme Court. Uh, so we do have that. It hasn't been ruled out yet because the concern was it was going to get too mixed up with the election in November. I mean, in August, and this is on the November ballot. So the decision has been made to start slowly informing the public, but right after the election in August, it will hit it into the community big time. One other, one other thing, we do civics um, 
instruction and were tested uh, on a Florida State ass uh, assessment and measured on civics. Uh, correct, Dr. Wild? It's a to graduate. And it's a, it's a yeah. to and what grade? Seventh grade. Seventh grade. And in high school, we take um, world, history, US history, world history, U.S. history, economics. So it's a we teach civics. So basically, it's a yes, teaching of civics. No, it'll ta it, it says yeah. to teach civics. So it's kind of like, like it's it's a teaching. it's um okay. it's uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> but is that it's misleading? Mean? It's misleading. <laughs> it's misleading yeah. to 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 for like you say to further a cause. So the point the is some legislator's kid went to school and didn't pass or take it and then they put it in the bill. Typically what happens. Tell them, And you had people watch Jay Leno a lot, unfortunately. Excuse me. Yeah. The Women's League of Voters, if I want, just to get that clarified, they're actually suing, you said. We have, we have, we have uh, PowerPoint and all the talking points in a, uh, for all amendments. Uh, including this one. Uh, this is the one they have chosen to file suit against because of the way it was stacked. And um, so that is ongoing. And we will have all that information. We are already putting up speaking opportunities starting at the 1st of September. And uh, so that that will be on in the public domain on many places as well as being taped and put on TV and being on radio and that sort of thing. And the way it was stacked is to, it, it says we are, basically we're not having civics when we are, and that's the, that's where the suit is coming from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, legis the, the Constitution Revision Commission process, and I've had the dubious honor of following all three of them, uh, is where they have the authority to group their proposals in any fashion that they wish. Uh, this is why there's one further down the ballot that has vaping and fracking together. Uh, not quite sure of the relationship, except there's smoke involved. Uh, but uh, in this particular instance, uh, they, they took what they felt were the, quote, education proposals. Um, and that was obviously the school board uh, uh, term limits, uh, the, the issue of uh, literacy, uh, which is already has been in statute for some time. Um, and uh, I, I would suggest to you, uh, without trying to take a position one way or the other, uh, two things. One is those six words that are in there, comma, established by the district school board, comma, limit school boards purely to the schools under which they have direct control. More importantly, it allows the legislature to have the freedom of establishing any type of school system, school, school network. Uh, uh, the, the focus has been on the charter school authorizer, but this goes much beyond that. Uh, but it gives them full flexibility of establishing any other type of educational uh, entity, if you will. Uh, and uh, that could possibly give one pause for some concern. The other factor tied in with that, uh, and this is, uh, you, you know me, I'm a, a Bible thumper when it comes to Article 9, Section 1, uh, when we talk about the paramount duty of the legislature is to have, provide for adequate uh, schools, but for a uniform system of equal education. And I'm not quite sure how we would be able to juxtapose giving the legislature full unbridled freedom on one hand and yet still maintain a uniform equal system of public education. Um, uh, they can do that, but I'm not quite sure how. And I think those are two questions that really need to be debated uh, and to try to, to uh, at least ferret this thing out. That proposal initially began as purely let the state have a separate authorizer for charter schools. It morphed into like those six words I said, which really uh, gave, gave the uh, expansion. And I, I think one of the telltale signs, at least for me, was the fact that in the end, uh, you had the current chair of the State Board of Education, current member of the State Board of Education, former member of the State Board of Education, and the commissioner of education voting against it because they were concerned about the degree of, of I'm gonna say flexibility and what uh, uh, that could do uh, uh, as it pertains to Article 9, Section 1. So uh, hopefully this thing will get debated. Uh, uh, it may very well have merit, uh, may very well not have merit, but uh, uh, it is currently hidden uh, in uh, the fact between literacy and school board term limits, and yet that is the main uh, uh, issue uh, that the uh, Constitution Revision Commission was really out to, to pass. Follow up. It, that that's the that's the worst part of the whole bill is that anybody can open up a school and get government funding, and it, it just it would be a tragedy for education of the child. And I don't think that uh, 
that the citizens of, of Florida understand how detrimental that could be to the education process of different children. That, you know, uh, there was a couple, probably what, eight years ago, nine years ago, we had a school that we, few of us had to vote to shut down in the Orange Blossom Mall that wasn't given adequate education. And it's incumbent upon the school board of St. Lucie County to vote and continue to make sure that those charters do have quality teachers and that they are uh, meeting some type of standard. And, it, and if there's no one able to watch those organizations that just pop up and say we're a school and cl collect state funding, we're going to be in a world of mess, not just as, as a school district here, but as a society where kids don't get a quality education. Yeah, you can say you're teaching civics, but giving a kid a civics book and telling them to read it and not giving any tests or standards and not having any measure is going to hurt our, our, our way of life. Yeah. And, that, and that's the crux of the whole situation. You know, you can have vouchers, you can have charter schools, and you have those opportunities, but to willy-nilly open it up car blunts is sad and it's sad that it's even on there yeah. and i think that the, the point is that this is not just about charter schools that's been the the cause celeb uh there are a lot of very good charter schools in this state uh but this is uh, uh allowing the legislature to create things that we haven't even thought about at this point um may i get back to the legislative priorities yeah, for a I'm moment gonna, <laughs> let, me just, let me just summarize it because I, I just went to the to the web page there creates a term limit of eight and this is what everybody has said eight consecutive years for school board members and requires the legislature to provide for the promotion of civic literacy in public schools. Currently, district school boards have a constitutional duty to operate, control, and supervise all public schools. The amendment maintains a school board's duties to public schools it establishes, but permits the state to operate, control, and supervise public schools not established by the school board. On legislative priorities, if we may, maybe just for a quick second to look at the priorities that uh, uh, we used uh, on behalf of St. Lucie during this past year. Uh, we did have the required local effort issue, the half mill we've already have addressed, that is an FSBA. We will submit that separately for uh, the Greater Florida Consortium. Uh, funding levels, uh, I'm gonna suggest to you that uh, we do work up a, a recommendation on the FEFP in December. And I'm saying that because by that point, everybody will have gone through the budget process uh, and will have a better idea. Rather than saying, please, sir, may we have some more, the key thing is to say, okay, if we're going to maintain current program for next year, what is our baseline? Uh, what do we actually need based upon uh, uh, current uh, programs, based upon actual growth projections for FY20, uh, and be able to come up either with a dollar figure or, or with a percentage. And I believe that uh, December, early January, will be in a much better position uh, than we are uh, currently to, uh, to do that. Um, dual enrollment is something else that also has, has uh, uh, surfaced where the legislature this past session did uh, allow that uh, uh, private schools, uh, students in private schools to not have to pay tuition uh, for dual enrollment courses. Uh, the legislature appropriated a separate dollar amount to cover their instructional materials. But the uh, state colleges uh, who may uh, accept uh, private school dual enrollment students are also covering the tuition at the state college level. That reopens the debate, obviously, that we've had about uh, public schools and where uh, that cost of tuition has been placed upon the school district. Uh, and I just toss out if you wanted to consider anything relative to having uh, go back to where the state covers the cost of tuition for dual enrollment students as once upon a time they, they did. <laughs> Agree. Is that any other? Do you want to put? Mm. If I may, Madam Chair, uh, you know we we fought this battle for many years, and they made it even muddier last year when they paid for some schools, but not all schools. Uh, and I think it also puts the state colleges in a difficult position in some cases. So I think that should be something that we continue to fight for. Okay. Um, excuse me, school options. Um, we had in there some language relative to uh, uh, program choice. I think, again, I would suggest holding on that till we see what happens with uh, uh, Amendment 8. Um, the Treasure Coast Work Group has had had a position, which St. Lucie obviously is part of, 
uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Jen actually uh, went through this back in a former district of uh, deregulation of school districts, of being able to have flexibility uh, in terms of either a compact or, a, or an agreement with the state. Uh, Got to st still meet state goals, still have to deal with, um, obviously with collective bargaining, still would have to deal with life safety, still would have to uh, deal with federal issues, but much of the organization and how you go about expending funds could be uh, uh, flexible at the local level. Um, this, we've had this issue. Uh, it hasn't gone anywhere in the past, uh, but there has been some renewed interest, and I don't know if you want to at least maybe think about that to come back uh, with a suggestion in, uh, in December uh, as, a, as a, I'm going to say, as a deregulated school district uh, kind of, of concept. The assessment piece I think I mentioned about suggesting that we hold off. So um, is there anything else that you'd like to try to see us um, pursue with FSBA or uh, the consortium at this point? If not, then what I'm hearing at this, I think, is that uh, uh, to make the recommendation on the safe schools uh, funding, uh, both consortium and FSBA, uh, uh, request to make sure they go back to the two mills, which is currently in the greater consortium, but at least to reiterate that uh, with the consortium, and then the uh, issue on dual enrollment. Sounds right. Sounds good. Anything else? And with your permission, what I would like to do is uh, 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 essentially, uh, uh, Ms. Holly, are you handling both the FSBA and uh, consortium at this point? Okay, because uh, I'll take your name in vain. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're the forms that we have to fill out, uh, and uh, if you you'll give me the, the uh, flexibility to be able to go ahead and, and write those up, and uh, I'll submit that uh, to you for your okay with the superintendent, and then we'll make sure everybody has a copy of that. Going back to... Um Amendment 8, I just want the community to understand in lay person terms that um, as a consensus here at the school district, we are really asking you to vote no on Amendment 8. And uh, I know sometimes it can get very difficult for people in our community to really understand uh, the amendments that, that are out there. Um, and our reasoning for saying, asking you to do such a thing is because there has been a combined, uh, several different areas uh, in that amendment uh, that, you know, for one, for the school board limit, you know, you should have that right to be able to decide who stays and who goes. And so uh, allowing the state to decide after eight years, you no longer can have the person that you desire to be on that board no longer can serve is taking that uh, freedom and that autonomy out of your hands. So we just ask you to read it uh, uh, very clearly. Amendment 8 uh, that has to do with your county, has to do with your school board um, and uh, your public schools. And so uh, we do not feel at all that that would be something beneficial to our county and our community. So we ask you to remember that when you vote. And I believe it's on the August 28th. It's, it's not on November, the primary. November 6th. It's November. Okay, so we will continue to come forward uh, with a, hopefully a campaign to help you understand uh, the reasonings behind it and the reason why we're asking you not to vote yes on that. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, the Amendment 8 is not a legislative issue, but rather a Constitution revision issue, and it is an item on our agenda today that I would like to bring forth for a vote on consensus to go forward with the consortium. Very good. Very good. Before we leave uh, with Mr. Crawford, I think in December, depending on what happens with Amendment 1 and 2, uh, we will need to have a, probably a different level of conversation because it's some things that we rely on municipal and county government to be able to assist us with, uh, they may be further hampered. And uh, as most entities will be revisiting their budget in December, uh, depending on what they do, we may be revis revising our legislative priorities also. Madam Chairman, this is one of the things that I was thinking. I was sort of caught off guard today. I know Vern was coming to get a report, but um, <clears throat> looking for other things of interest, as Mr. Superintendent, it might be uh, just behoove of us just to look at some of our, our our weak areas amongst the system and figure out how our, how uh, those areas um, don't allow us to 
to perform to the maximum of our ability. And one of the things I was thinking of, and I'm not sure if this is a legislative thing or not, but some of our employees didn't make the cut last year because they didn't pass a test looking at um, um, looking at teacher teachers not being able to pass certification maybe go into the state and I'm not sure if it's state problem or what whose problem it is but I, but I've heard that from some numerous principals saying you know hey we need another year with them to help maybe develop their skills and sentence in this area to help them develop their knowledge to be able to pass the test because you hire the person in what is it, uh, August, and then they have to take a test by the end of the school year, which would enable us, not give us enough time to help them. Full-time job, new teacher, tons of responsibility, and then, you know, they don't have enough time to be able to study what they, with, which, which they should have been able to study for. So I'm not sure, I just know that was one of our weakest areas, I don't want to say weakest areas, but one of the areas that caused us some stumbling blocks to build capacity in the school district to be able to be where we want to be. And, I, and that's just the one that came off the top of my mind. But there's some other ones as I'm sitting here thinking that I don't want to embarrass myself because that could be something that we could just fix ourselves. But something that, you know, we might want to discuss as a smaller workshop and say, you know, hey, this is something that's hindering us from being the best we can be. So just food for thought. You know, we'll just look at, look at some of our areas that say, hey, this isn't working for us and this is what we might need to change. I have such a great line, but I won't use it. Um, I know. Um, in all seriousness, the teacher certification is an issue, and I think that we have to frame it correctly, that it almost needs some kind of a, you know, an independent, I don't know, comprehensive review, because certain teachers, um, where some struggle is, is in the math area, but if I'm at the primary or elementary a age, and, and, this, and I'm dealing with, um, you know, algebra and geometry and some other things that I won't need, it, 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 it does hinder us. And I know that there's been conversation over the last couple of years. Um, Vern talked about at the very beginning, which I think is important, the whole retirement deal. We, you know, we lose a lot of good teachers uh, to retirement and then they, you know, they can come back, but they lose it, everything for a year years. or do the flexibility to, to let them come back in, uh, particularly um, in maybe even in shortage areas of, of exceptional education in, in ELA and the sciences or the, or the core the core areas. I mean, I'm open to any you know any of them that 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 are good coming right back and not even retiring. But I think that that's something that the state has to look at, and it's not unique here. That is a national. That's a national national uh, problem. Uh, that's compounded by the accountability system as well as the pressures on that uh, on, on the teachers when they come in um, uh, right out of college. The college preparedness is totally inadequate. In my, in my mind, in preparing uh, students, I don't even know if we teach the, the standards in, in college, you know, um, those kinds of things. I don't want to get off on a, on a tangent there, but I think it's a great point uh, that, you, that you make, that it's um, not unique to us, but everywhere. And then we have done things to try to support those teachers through um, courses in the evening, uh, that teachers have come and, and, and helped them out. And, 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 and uh, so that doesn't mean that the teacher's not good and not smart. It's a very, very difficult test that doesn't sometimes line up to what their, their, their um, expertise is, um, if, if I've said that clear enough for you. No, 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 that, that's basically what I said. And also a teacher that's been teaching 25, 30 years goes in the drop, says, oh, I'm gonna retire. They retire, and then two years, you know, then, then they, realize, they realize, oh, I wish I never did that. And I know there are certain exceptions, but, you know, let's, let's throw it out there. That whole leave, drop, and wait out a year is for, for, for people making the big bucks retiring and coming back so what they did is they they went to penalize the the big guy and penalize the whole entire system and and, and, and that's teachers and everybody I mean because I read between the lines that's what it was all about so and, I mean it, they have to yeah. they have to be able to look at it and say who are they targeting and saying what's best for for the education system that's my feeling that's why you have a number of people who are up in New York and New Jersey and other states where they retire because they can come into Florida without any, any penalty uh, through their own retirement system. But I, I think you're going to have that, and I would, I would suggest I think you're on the right track as far as coming up with data because that's the whole thing. We, we've been out there asking, saying, give us the ability to be able to hire back a teacher. I'm going to say hypothetically, one month, no penalty. 
where we've got demonstrated local need or demonstrated state need, uh, we need to be able to show what those needs particularly are uh, and be able to deal with it on a, a, not a case-by-case -case situation, but certainly on a, on a subject by subject area situation. And the more that we can demonstrate that, because uh, I'm going to suggest to you that colleges of education do have declining enrollments these days, among other things. Uh, so that makes a, uh, a successful veteran teacher probably that much more valuable. But the data is what's going to drive that. So uh, that might be very helpful uh, to come up with that. Chair, may I, may I suggest that after we... your last comment in this area because we want to move on with the board yeah. meeting. As we get the data, uh, we know that in January very likely we will have a reorganized Department of Education and very likely a reorganized State Board of Education that we have the data and that we are ready, if need be, to present our case to the new players. Thank you, Mr. Byrne Crawford. We appreciate you coming this evening. My pleasure. Thank and you. And the Greater Florida Consortium. I'm going to introduce your guest. My uh, coach, my, my chauffeur, uh, uh, my uh, uh, love of uh, 31 years is my spouse, Lila Pickup Crawford, is also our vice president her. for uh, accountability. Can we please have a stand? I can't see her behind me. The... Okay. Thank you for coming. We got uh, now we'll hear from uh, Bill Tomlinson. And John, are you part of this one too? You're going to set the stage? I'm setting the platter. The stage will be set shortly, Mr. Gent. I've got my. I feel like we should get a spotlight. Drum roll, from Bill Tomlinson, Executive Director, Student Services, Brian Ruther, School Security Chief, Double Duty, School Safety Specialist, and John Gillette, our uh, Facilities Director of Facilities and Maintenance. Well, um, what we want to talk about today is uh, basically the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Safety Act. And the reason these three gentlemen are, um, are here is because they're going to have different portions of this presentation because this is a really all-encompassing uh, uh, Senate bill that impacts our safety and security of our students, the, the social emotional health of our students, which is our educational function of our students, and also the maintenance and, and in some cases uh, our, our facilities. So with that being said, I also, Bill is going to be hit, uh, hitting on the implications of Title IV, which is the Every Child Succeeds Act, and also House Bill 7055, which is the Hope Scholarship Bill, and also that's, uh, that bill's implications. So I know Mr. Gent has shared just, um, you know, kind of culturally where we've been with the adoption of the Kids at Hope philosophy, and that's the direct support for St. Uh, Lucy's Community of Hope. The personnel has trained the community health philosophy at all schools. Our positive behavior interventions and support, and currently we have 22 model schools, and the superintendent's goal is that every school is a model school. Our CHAMPS classroom management model, which is a continued emphasis on protecting classroom instruction, setting high expectations, and establishing structure in the classroom. A well-established mental health collaborative, which is supported by many of our local mental health agencies within our own community and multiple collaborative agreements from community agencies providing support to address substance abuse, violence, truancy, and absenteeism. A continued focus on addressing the staffing formula for school counselor, and testing coordinators that over the last few years have been added to every school to allow school counselors free time, or not free time, but designated time with direct counseling activities instead of doing testing responsibilities all day. And also the signs of prevention suicide curriculum, and that's presented to all of our ninth grade students. And I just wanted to hit on a couple of things because I know we focus on our academics and, and we should, um, but the safety and security of our students is a priority. And I just wanted to throw a couple of things, and I know we've shared this with you, but over the last uh, two years, we've written 6,200 fewer referrals. And once again, that's a tribute to the work that Bill has done. And that's, that shows that, that really we create a culture of relationships with our schools and also our high school suspension uh, our high school suspension rate has dropped by 27 percent 
and that's adding another 5,000 instructional days for our students. That's a huge impact, you know, being in other districts uh, and saying our goal is 3% and saying that we've reduced that by 17% and 27% respectively is just a, a really impressive feat. And those referrals and those suspensions are mainly in our high poverty schools. So I just want to commend uh, all of our teachers and our educators for really making that a focus. <clears throat> so over the last six years, we've had a lot of upgrades in our safety and security. We've uh, put $5.6 million into single point entry systems, fencing, alarms, intercoms, access, that, uh, that's trying to make sure we have a focus on single point of entry, security cameras and equipment, all of our schools currently have security camera systems and also security enhancements. And at this time, we're going to go in order. Uh, Bill is going to talk about our social emotional and what we're planning from as we move forward after, um, after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Brian's going to hit on the security, and then John is going to give you an update on what we're doing with our facilities. Thank you, Dr. Prince. Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Jen, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to speak to you about what we're doing in student services and how this piece of legislation is truly affecting everything that we do. It's been a very busy time in our department this summer, and we continue to try to piece together everything that was brought forth in this legislation to be able to make sense of it and to align it with the work that we are currently doing and have been doing for many years to address mental health issues for children. We had, as Dr. Prince said in his slide, we've had a well-established mental health collaborative. Last year we had around 700 children that were referred out for mental health services through that collaborative. And we wouldn't be able to do all of this without the local support of the community agencies that we partner with. They've been dynamic partners all along to really help us to achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve. This piece of legislation, Senate Bill 7026, did codify exactly this year what SEDNET is responsible for. SEDNET is the Severe Emotionally Disabled Network. It's a multi-discipline network, a multi-agency network, and we are the fiscal agent for SEDNET. We do serve all four regions, Okeechobee, St. Lucie Martin, and Indian River. We will now have a SEDNET specialist, and that SEDNET specialist will work directly with Mr. Ruther on his role as a safe school specialist because SEDNET is also going to pick up the responsibility that was outlined in Senate Bill 7026 to do youth mental health first aid training. And I'll get into that in just a moment. This bill also did revise certain procedures that we can take with students in regards to discipline. If we see that children are posing a threat, if they have made threats against the school system, we have the authority in certain situations to review those or to refer those students for mental health services as well. And it did allow us to revise the code of conduct in, as it relates to students and our collaboration with mental health providers as well as law enforcement. Try to learn to operate this. One of the unique pieces, and, and Mr. Ruther will talk about this a little bit more as well, and that is the requirement to establish a threat assessment team at every school. And that threat assessment team is indicated in the legislature that it must have persons with an expertise in counseling. There must be someone from school administration, someone familiar with instruction, and law enforcement that is also part of that threat assessment team. Whenever we see children that are posing a threat to themselves or others, the threat assessment team is required to take action, and that could be in collaboration with law enforcement or with mobile crisis units if the child needs to be uh, participate in a Baker Act situation or an involuntary examination. What they don't outline in the legislation is how do you train those members. So that is something that we've been working on this summer. 
We've been reviewing different types of curriculum that is available, and we are, we've settled on the PREPARE curriculum, which is recommended by the National Association of School Psychologists. So that will be training that is provided for all of the members of the threat assessment team, as well as the youth mental health first aid training that we will provide as well. And this, there is also a requirement that the threat assessment teams will collect quantitative data and report that to the Office of Safe Schools every year. So there are data elements that we will now be looking to collect as part of this process as well. Back to SEDNET for just a moment. SEDNET again is that discretionary project that we oversee in our department serving the, the four county area. Recently, as part of this, there was a um, piece of legislation that says every school board employee will be trained in youth mental health first aid. That is making individuals aware of the, what to look for and how to assist children or families in obtaining the support and the resources that they may need. We have been doing youth mental health first aid in this district since 2015. We had written a grant early on through SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Association. We did receive that grant. We have five trainers currently on staff, so we're a little bit ahead of the game, but we will also now oversee a new discretionary project, which is called the Youth Mental Health Aid Training Project. The RFA was released for that. I did complete that last week. That has been submitted to the DOE. That gives us a discretionary budget of $223,000 to work with on the youth mental health first aid training in the Quad County area. What we will be looking to establish is a cadre of 60 trainers throughout the four counties so that they will have sufficient number of people to provide the training for youth mental health first aid. This came out from the DOE through a conference call. We have a follow-up call tomorrow for clarification as to whether or not this will stand as it was stated, but it was that teachers, paraprofessionals, and, and administrators in grades five through 12 must participate in the full eight-hour training for youth mental health first aid, but those individuals working in grades two um, we'll have the training provided for them in a two-hour module, so they will not have to do the full training. I'm get a little bit lost with this. I'm sorry, for just a moment. Yes. Looking for it. SEDNA, is that an acronym or is that really a name of something? That is an acronym, Severely Emotionally Disabled Network. That's what I was looking for. I couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah. I'm going to go backwards there if you don't care for me, Brian. Yeah. Brian will Three, but I couldn't find it anywhere else. Keep going back. Just. Dr. Prince gave us a new clicker, so I'm a little off on yeah. this. I, 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 I'll keep going back for just a second. Yeah. I missed the training on this one, yeah. Remedial training. Yeah. Back, back further. That's that's good right there. Thank you. That's good. There Thank you. Go. you. All right. That's that one. That's that one. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So anyway, the youth mental health first aid training, that is something that we're going to have to really spend time and, de and determine how that we're going to get all of the individuals that will be required to participate in the training trained throughout the course of the year. And the Department of Education will come out with additional um, guidance for us on this in the near future. One of the things that we're planning to do, as I said, was the prepare curriculum to work with the threat assessment teams. That is a one-day training that is provided for them. There are stipulations provided in that training that you can only do 100 individuals at a time. So we will have two separate trainings that we will provide to begin with. There is a two-day training for prepared that specifically addresses the needs of school psychologists, social workers, and school counselors. So that training has been set for August 20th and 21st. And that's the first in a series of trainings that will be held for them. It's a pretty in-depth mo model of training. 
And we do believe that this will also enhance what we do when we respond to crisis. And we do have our school psychologists and social workers that respond to crisis throughout the course of the year. Well, hold on, I'm still thinking on the, the slide behind you. When it requires youth mental health first aid for all the employees in the district. Yes. And is, is that the four people going out and doing that? I missed that well, part, we are, I'm still stuck on Sedna. Because we're now going to oversee a new discretionary grant, Yeah. we will eventually have a cadre of 60 trainers, 60 trainers. within the four county area That's right. that will be required to provide training for all of the employees in each one of these school districts. And they're going to do it like a half day off or what's the, that look like? In the, my training, mind? the training, well, in we gotta figure that out. the training in itself is a full eight hour training. That's what I thought but I heard What you we're say. trying to do is to see what allowable accommodations can be made if we can do this in two half day trainings or four two hour trainings, whatever will best work for individuals that have to be trained. There is not a lot of professional development days built into the calendar. Uh, these are requirements that are built into law, so we have to figure out how we, we work to accommodate the people that need to be trained. Well, I heard you say that the first time, but I wasn't processing it. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yes, Mr. Jim. Bill, real quick answer. Uh, and if you don't have one, then that's fine too. I know we talk about the eight hour face to face training and it's mandatory five grades five through 12. What do we do for K through four? Since there will be does a, that mean we don't have issues? There will be a two hour <laughs> module that is developed for those grade groups if the DOE continues on the path that they're planning for that. We'll know more tomorrow on the conference call with them, but it looks as though those grades will only have to participate in the two hour module. It's one of the biggest challenges that our, that our teachers face, even at the kindergarten level, and you all know this better than I do, some of you, regarding some of the, um, the challenges that the children bring to school. It's not, it doesn't start at fifth grade. And I, and I know the teachers get very, very frustrated with that because they're ill-equipped to deal with it. And Bill's done a fantastic job trying to train. But, uh, so we'll wait to hear from after the meeting where we go from there. Thank you. Also included in Senate Bill 7026 was the mental health services allocation, which was been provided to all districts. We um, brought that forward, a comprehensive mental health plan to the board in June that has been voted on that has to be submitted to the Department of Education by August the 1st. And that is very specific that the money, 90% of those funds must be spent specifically on addressing mental health issues for children. And as I had stated earlier, we have a good system in place. There is always room for improvement. And what we wanted to do with that and what the board agreed to was our plan to expand those services for additional school psychologists and social workers. So that is what we're trying to do at this point in time. The districts also were um, given information that charter schools don't really have to develop their own plan. They can opt to come in under our plan if they should choose to do that. It is only if they want their piece of the allocation, their proportionate share of that allocation, that they would have to develop their own plan. So Somerset Academy and Somerset College Prep have decided to develop their own plan, but Renaissance at St. Lucie and Renaissance at Tradition have opted to come in under our plan. And we will be providing and services and allowing them to participate in any of the activities that we do to support the mental health services of children. And again, this is where we begin the report collect or the data collection for reporting back to the DOE by September the 30th of 2019. We will have to report activities that have taken place in the 1819 school year to address mental health and how those dollars were spent. Again, we're expanding five new positions for social workers. We've already hired three of those. We have two that are pending. We have five openings for school psychologists. We um, 
have two interviews again tomorrow. We have 11 separate agencies that are recruiting for us through an RFP that we released and our human resources department has been sending notices to other states as well, trying to help us to, to um, obtain school psychologists. But as you well know, that is a critical shortage area and we are competing with almost every other district in the state for school psychologists at this point. We will be adding a mental health counselor for Del Cassens because that is a school where many children are at that second chance level or they've been placed there due to recommendations for expulsion. But in lieu of that, they've been given a stipulated order. We also have our most severely intensive children with behavioral or emotional disturbance in that school as well. And contracting with a clinical psychologist for those children that have expressed threats and we have been working with outside agencies on this as well already this year. We know we will still have to also pay for some services for children that we cannot bill Medicaid for or they do not have private insurance because it was pretty clear in the governor's letter that all children should have access to mental health services, thus the reason for the allocation. We are not able to do everything that we are trying to do simply through that mental health service allocation. We're concentrating heavily on prevention. So we've been able to work very closely with Dr. Wild and the federal programs to use Title IV dollars to develop a, a Department of, of um, Social and Emotional Learning. We did just recently hire the director for that, Tracy Wilkie. She was approved at the board last week. We have two social and emotional learning specialists. It's amazing to see what work they've already accomplished in such a short time. We have a train the trainer for social and emotional curriculum coming up on August the 2nd to address elementary needs. We have a lot of research that's going on for six through eight and nine through 12 curriculum. We already have one of the specialists trained in the 9 through 12 curriculum as a trainer, so she will be offering professional development in that. And Ms. Wilkie has been out working with principals to get their um, willingness to serve as having some demonstration classrooms where we can actually get and model what social and emotional learning should look like as it is embedded throughout the curriculum and not something separate that we're requiring people to do every day. There was a bill in 2016 also that addressed character education and Dr. Wild brought this up at one of our meetings that this would also be a good way to link social and emotional learning into what goes on at the high school with this requirement. So we are looking to uh, actually align the social and emotional learning to character education requirement as well. All of those areas that are listed there must be uh, taught as part of character education. We are continuing, as I said, prevention before intervention. That's going to be our motto that you... I got a question. Okay. That last part there. Go ahead. Next slide. That's, that, that's not going to be like in high school. That would be like, just like student success in high school. We're not going to do that every year, like freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. It's usually done through freshman, freshman academy. Se okay, that's mm -hmm. why I want to make sure mm -hmm. I find out freshman my, seminar. my kids are taking this every year. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's important. Don't get me wrong. As we continue to work toward that goal of having all of our schools come on as model schools under PBIS, we strengthen our work with the University of South Florida and the discretionary project to address positive behavioral interventions and supports. Last year we had 22 model schools in the district. Our data currently indicates that we are on track to have 25 model schools and the goal is within two years to try to have all schools as model schools under PBIS. We are doing core team training right now, either the one day or the three day model. And you heard Dr. Prince say in his slide that we're also continuing to do our work Teachers can't teach if there is classroom disruption. We've got to do everything that we can do to protect the integrity of that instruction. So we have to establish expectations and structure inside of the classroom as well. And we also know that what happens when children first get on the bus can set the tone for what happens the rest of the day in school. So last year we did a lot of work with our bus drivers on PBIS and CHAMPS and they've asked us to continue that work with them again this year. 
They were very appreciative, the bus drivers and bus aides of that last year. This one, the Hope Scholarship, this was out of House Bill 7055. This took effect upon becoming law. It just went through rulemaking authority on the 18th, so it is now official that there is uh, provisions on what we must do to provide this information to parents if they feel that their child has been bullied in school or if any of these other safety incident reporting items have been of a concern to a parent we have an obligation to inform them of the hope scholarship as well as to complete the investigation what is not stipulated in this piece of legislation is like bullying, for example, under bullying, we determine whether it was substantiated or unsubstantiated. It doesn't clarify it. It's that the HOPE scholarship information must be provided to the parent. This allows them to um, take the funds to obtain private school admission, to pay for tuition, or to seek another public school within the school system. And this is just some provisions that deadlines that must be followed within 24 hours of this being of us being noticed that there is a complaint or a situation we must notify the parent, notify the offender's parent, and we must also give information to the superintendent about what has been reported to us. And then after 15 days, we must report back the. Uh, Including online, any type of online bullying, or is this just cyberbullying? Cyber? It's okay. bullying, and cyberbullying would fall under more. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, we're still waiting on technical, official technical assistance to come out about this, but this Hope Scholarship is on a first come, first serve basis. So, the, this says it takes effect for the 18-19 school year, and we will follow the guidelines as they come forward. Thank you so much. You have any questions that I could answer? Uh, I just got a comment. <laughs> Going back on page nine, that slide where it says requirements education nine through twelve. And I know it's that that's the requirement, but but eventually we're gonna have to start forward thinking and put it in the middle school, probably sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, some type of uh, supplemental type of education eventually because that you know by ninth grade a lot of these skills are learned research skills organization skills creating a resume and stuff is, is great but when you start looking at the emotional side and some of the social side absolutely it, it's already started at sixth seventh and eighth grade when as soon as they get their iphone or their phone mm -hmm. we're, we're toasted so i mean the, the these skills are great for the high school level i just said toasted on tv didn't i these skills are great for the high school level, but for the emotional part and probably the social part needs to be forwarded. And, and before a law comes out, we should probably be forward thinking. And that's why we're starting with social and emotional learning at pre-kindergarten and moving all the way up for that. Some type of formal curriculum. Yes. Sort of like we have, you know, Dr. Wild was forward thinking when she came up with this. Yes, there you go, Helen when she did this about three, four or five years ago with freshman seminar, and we already had it. So, you know, I don't hear many other districts having that middle school part. So, just something to think about. But we will eventually have formalized curriculum for social emotional learning at all grade levels. As, 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 we, as we transition, and, and this is so heartfelt, Bill, is a superstar. His team is our superstars. Um, the amount of work that's required of, of our special, uh, our ESC department and the new mandates that are coming down from the state. Um, he's a guru in the state. This is a perfect example of someone that does not want to retire. Um, you don't want to, right? All right, anyway, um, <laughs> but uh, in, all, in all seriousness, Bill, you know, Bill, Bill is on it, and his team is on it, and uh, the, the principals recognize that, our school recognizes that, the folks that he deals with in the community, the parents, you know, he and his, his crew, I mean, we have a great team here, but uh, this, is tough. this is one of the, the toughest jobs in, in, the, in the school district is, is the one that Bill has. So I just want to say that publicly, sincerely, that we appreciate what he does, and um, 
appreciate that. You're, you're off the hot seat now. Well, I also want to make a comment, too, about Mr. Tomlinson. It is, and I know that every other board member has to call him at least once a month or probably more times than I have to call him. But, but when you call him, he knows that child almost immediately, that it's not something that he has to say, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. He goes, well, oh, I know who you're talking about. And you're talking about 41,000 students and a lot of students in the ESC, and, and that's just a tribute to, to his leadership and, and, and how much he cares, not just for the system, but for each individual child. Thank you. Thank you, the same thing here with parents that have called or have had problems. Um, you really know how to soothe a parent. And when they talk with you, they, they always say you're a great guy. So thank you and your team for what you're doing. Thank you. I have a great team and a great support system in the school system, and I really appreciate all of your support as well. It's been wonderful. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. <laughs> I guess up here. Ah. There's no truth to the rumor that I became the school safety specialist because I know how to work the clicker. So, <laughs> But anyway, uh, before I get started, I do want to say is I really sincerely appreciate the board, Mr. Jen, Dr. Prince's support for our security initiatives. I know we don't go out and tout, we don't advertise all of our security improvements, obviously. Uh, but we have accomplished a lot in the last several years. We have made significant improvements in our safety and security systems, and I do appreciate your continued to support your interests and your desire to make a safe and caring environment for our students and our staff. It has meant a difference, and like I said, we, we have accomplished a lot, some of which I will go over with in the presentation. Uh, Senate Bill 7026 has put forth a number of significant requirements for the district. A safety special, which obviously uh, I was selected for that position. Uh, I was already in the role as Chief of Safety and Security. Uh, the risk assessments, I will talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, we're actively engaged in that. Uh, Bill mentioned a lot about the threat assessment team. Uh, the threat assessment team is, all, is going to include the SRO or the SRD on campus in addition to one of my officers will be part of that threat assessment team at each school. As Bill mentioned, they will receive training in how to determine whether or not something, an individual, their behaviors are a valid threat. And then obviously there will be things uh, that they will be able to initiate to respond uh, to issues or concerns of behavior. Uh, one school safety officer, a safety guardian, in uh, each school in the beginning of the school year, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes. Uh, Crime Watch program, which uh, we'll be talking about down the road as soon as the SROs and the SRDs are back on campus, is one of the things I want them to get involved in on campus, because obviously uh, establishing relationships with the students, uh, they know what's going on. And as we've seen with our Crime Stopper uh, banners in schools, we are getting information as to what is happening on campuses. And I think a lot of times, uh, getting that information, be able to act on it. You, you can't quantify something that hasn't happened, but I can tell you our SROs, our SODs, our officers are on top of it. They are establishing relationships with students and we are getting information as to what's happening. Uh, formulate uh, active shooter and hostage uh, situation drills, I'll get into in a couple of minutes, as well as the implementing the active shooter training. Again, here are some of the specific responsibilities of the school safety specialists as far as establishing policies and procedures, policies and procedures being in compliance with rules and regulations, providing training, serving as a liaison, coordinating the risk assessments, the campus tours, all those things I will, like I said, I'll get into a little bit further in a couple of minutes, and even testing the emergency of communications equipment. So there's been a number of uh, significant responsibilities that have been thrusted on the district specifically in this position. Some of the things that we have accomplished, as you can see, uh, we are working towards a school resource officer deputy, one for each elementary, middle, K to eight, as well as performance-based, and two in the high schools in Dale Cassis. Right now, the proposal is for two at LPA. They had one, they'll be adding a second. Um, one at MOA, performance-based, uh, Creative Arts Academy, which has not had uh, SR, SRD in the past, that is the proposal that has been put forth by the Sheriff's Office. Uh, code red training and drills, we had a committee of law enforcement, safety and security. Uh, we basically revised the entire code red protocols. 
Uh, it's no longer just a lockdown. We are in run, hide, fight. We've gone ahead and we've done some training with the principals at the Leadership Summit. Some of you may have seen that training this morning uh, and next Tuesday we are training, we're developing a cadre of instructors that actually can teach along with law enforcement or one of my personnel at the school. Uh, that person will also be responsible for coordinating the training and the drills because we're going to see a lot more training and drills than we've seen in the past. It looks like we're going to have to do at least two trainings a year and we also do two drills also a year. So that is going to increase significantly. Uh, campus staff involvement is going to increase significantly. So we re really need to have some staff members on campus that can assist with training. We trained 39 people this morning uh, over at Port St. Lucie High School. Uh, it was about a three and a half hour training. Uh, we're going to train, I think next week's class is actually going to be a lot larger. Uh, and they train the trainer on the run, hide, fight strategy, the protocols which we are implementing with the new school year. And then drills. That's what we're looking at. Once each semester training, and then we normally do the two drills a year. So um, uh, I, I anticipate we're going to be somewhere up around with drills and training about 160 drills and tra combined drills and training for the entire district a year now. Uh, just to give you an idea, this past school year we did 45 drills, we did 45 trainings, 90 in total. Uh, because the additional training requirements, that's going to increase significantly. So uh, we are teaching, we are doing the trainer trainer. We're conducting it right now in conjunction with uh, our local law enforcement agencies and partnerships. Uh, security camera system, Dr. Prince did allude to it. Uh, with the last school getting a camera system installed in June, every school has an operational camera system working. So uh, that was a big accomplishment. When I took over, we had 12 schools that didn't have camera systems. Every school has a camera system uh, that is operational. And uh, we're looking at, with IT, embarking on an expansion program uh, in our additional schools, actually adding additional cameras. So that's kind of the next phase, is upgrading our camera system, upgrading our servers. Some of them are older, as well as expanding cameras to areas on campus that didn't initially have cameras and maybe concretables out there now and there's a need for additional cameras. We went ahead and we instituted the safety and security best practice work group. Uh, John kind of is kind of the lead on that. Uh, we do meet periodically. We do talk about uh, various projects to enhance safety and security. One of which, uh, which we're talking about is a Knox box, very similar to the fire department Knox box where First responders can enter the school. Uh, that is in the works. We're looking at Knox boxes for law enforcement that first responders can also enter the school in an emergency, in a lockdown emergency situation. So Treasure Coast Crime Stoppers, the banners, as you know, we have them in the high schools. Uh, we're going to be expanding into the middle as well as the K-8. to I'm just waiting on the banners. As soon as I get the call, we, I have 36 ordered through Crime Stoppers. They are funding that entire initiative. I have to tell you uh, that it's worked very well. Uh, shortly after the banners being installed, we've received four tips from the banners through the Crime Stoppers line, which goes actually to myself, uh, Deputy Chief Woods, and law enforcement to follow up. Uh, so the students have a way of anonymously reporting something. In addition to, uh, through IT and Terrence's group, we established, we now have an anonymous reporting app that they can actually go out on the app and they can report and it comes to myself to clear it to actually assign for follow-up investigation. The Crime Prevention Service, one of the things I started a couple of years ago and our, our local law enforcement partners are, are doing this and actually at no cost, which is always good. Uh, we are conducting uh, crime prevention surveys on all of our campuses. I have certified crime prevention officers from the Sheriff's Office, Fort Pierce Police, Port St. Lucie Police. Uh, we have conducted 19 thus far, and we will continue. What happens is normally when I get the uh, report back, I give a copy to Terrence and I give a copy to John, because a lot of times they're facility-related fencing issues. You know, fencing needs to be repaired or some signage issues and that. So. They'll get a copy of the survey. The security risk assessments that are required to be completed and submitted by August 1st, I have to tell you, it has encompassed my whole summer. 
Uh, these, they are extremely time consuming. Uh, it's a 199 question survey that has to be completed on every school. And I have to tell you, um, and it involves a lot of different areas. I'd like to thank the principals, IT cameras, John Facilities Group, uh, because without them, we could not have gotten it done. It is very time consuming, very complex. They're asking for dates. They're asking for attachments. I am pleased to say that we are 58% submitted as of the end of the day. So uh, we're on track, I uh, hope to be by the end of Thursday around 75% submitted to the state. So I've had to pull all the pieces together, go in, see what questions are not answered. And so it's, it's taken a tremendous amount of time. And uh, one of the things that'll come out of this is that when we do the other assessment that has to be done, the APAGA, which is done every year, which goes to the board for approval, uh, there'll be a number of rec security related recommendations for you to review as a result of these surveys. My offices additionally are conducting campus tours with law enforcement. They are generating a report which is required to be attached to the survey. Uh, they have completed pretty much, I, I, they have one more uh, next week to complete and they'll be done with those campus tours. The areas that I really, when I took over as uh, chief, uh, the areas I really focused on was access, access management, training, and communication. Um, went ahead and we implemented the Raptor system, the sex offender system. Uh, we have had probably since implementing it in 15, about 14, 15 hits, sex offender hits uh, on the system. We do investigate it um, and uh, we follow up with it. We have a guideline. I, I went ahead and I've just revised the guideline. I've tightened it up. There is training for front office staff on August 7th where I will be going over, not only will uh, Raptor be going over the new equipment and how to use the system again, providing training, but I'll be going over the guideline, the revision to the guidelines. In addition, uh, we went ahead and we've promulgated new entry door access protocols. Uh, you know, in the past, sometimes you'd walk up to a school and you press the buzzer and they just let you in. It's not gonna happen anymore. Um, what we are training our office staff to do is that when somebody presses the buzzer, especially somebody they don't know, uh, is to ask who they are for the identification, who they're there to see, and confirm that before they allow them in the system. The run, hide, fight training, all this stuff is, is, is excellent and it's great and we need to do the training, but honestly the key is not allowing somebody in the building in the first place. So we focused in the training today and I focused very heavily with staff on situational awareness, paying attention to what's going on outside the building, around the building, at, at arrival, at dismissal. Uh, they're gonna have to identify themselves, they're gonna be buzzed in, they're gonna be told to come to the main office, a Raptor check will be run on them. Uh, the other thing is uh, we're gonna have to probably uh, dispense with some courtesy, meaning that if you're going into and you're getting buzzed in and there's somebody coming in behind you, you can't hold the door for them, they have to go to uh, same thing, they got to buzz in, they got to identify themselves. Uh, so that's going to be implemented uh, in the uh, new, new school year. Lastly, communicate, oh, excuse me, I just done screwed up here. Communications, we have worked very, very hard on improving communication schools. I, I got involved in that and I've taken it over and actually came up with a plan to connect all the schools together through a digital network. We have purchased new and replacement over, will be around 600 radios in the last three or four years for the schools. Because uh, what I'm trying to do is migrate everything to a digital network where a principal at one school will be able to turn a dial and talk to a principal in the other school right on the radio through a repeater and the IP address. Right now that cannot be done with the old analog system. Also, we have, we have installed 11 repeaters on 10 schools to improve radio communication. And the uh, county, the law enforcement radio network of which we have a radio in every school is on the public safety uh, school system, net, uh, public safety network. Uh, we have installed 31 signal amplifiers in eight schools because we had some issues with them getting out on the portable radio. So we've gone ahead and uh, 
implemented those to improve. So we spent a lot of time and effort on communication. This is the banner uh, or the poster for the code red, the armed aggressor procedures. That poster is going to be in every classroom to continually reinforce the new run, hide, fight protocols. And John, you're up. make a couple of comments um, and thank Brian and his team for what they've done because their, their plate's been full too uh, to meet the legislative requirements. Um, this morning when uh, I presented to the, uh, the county uh, commission, I, I just wanted to, uh, for the viewing audience, to, to make a couple of comments because I think there's been some misinformation that's been out in the community and I want to clarify that. On, uh, after the Parkland incident occurred and we've, we've already had this conversation, um, we had a, a board workshop on March 27th. At that time, the board agreed to do an, an exclusive agreement with the Sheriff's Department as the lead law enforcement agency for the county. The rationale behind that was the fact that we've got a 32-year partnership with them, with the SROs in the school going back to 1986. Um, when the recession hit, it was the only uh, PD department that kept officers in our school centers. And then um, after the Parkland um, uh, tragedy, they, uh, the sheriff was the only law enforcement agency that actually placed officers in our schools. Each school has had that. Our, our other agencies helped us out with uh, patrols and, and being very, very visible on, uh, at the campus for pickup and, and drop off and, 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 and really increase their patrols there. Um, it was misreported uh, in the um, TC Palm on Sunday that we had somehow rebuffed um, local, uh, local municipalities, Port St. Lucie, or, or particularly Port St. Lucie, and that's not the case at all. Uh, this board had, uh, had, done the, had uh, voted unanimously for the exclusive agreement. The municipalities can do cooperative agreements with the sheriff's office. So if they choose to um, service the schools in their jurisdiction, there's nothing to stop them from doing that. It's that they will not go through the school district to do that. They will go through the sheriff's department. Um, one of the major topics that we talked about today was the sharing of that of that of that burden because the uh, sheriff of uh, the Saint the um, county commission has borne a lot of that over the years and um, we talked about what uh, what we're doing here in the grant the money that's coming down from the state but that there'll be continued conversations to uh, encourage our our other municipality partners to increase that presence in the schools. So when people are stating that, that we rebuffed or turned that away, that is completely false and, and not true, that uh, we would welcome uh, officers in the jurisdictions of those school centers. That would be up to those local municipal municipalities to budget that and work through the Sheriff's Department to put them in to our school centers. And I just want to make sure that that was clear for our viewing uh, public when, since we are broadcasting this uh, today out there. I'll turn it over to, um, to um, John, John, John Gillette. <laughs> Good all, all I can see was Brian going overtime, and uh, <laughs> uh, so you got you got you're on you're on the summary you're on the you're on the the quick hook. But no, this is so important. Yeah. That's why we're doing this today, and that's why we're taking a longer period of time because this is so important. As school is opening, yeah. that our community and our and and our, our our parents and folks feel secure and know that this has been a high priority over the summer, and so we are really taking our time with this presentation today. So, uh, John, you got it. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairman, Board Member, Mr. Gent, I am here to have a conclusion with a very short narrative on a very, very, very busy summer for us. We have, um, you know, focused on the things that the security enhancement group has got together. There are so many ideas, so many things that can come from so many different places, but the group of 13 people that meet together on this, in this group, focused on what's best for this county and what's best for our schools. And this summer, we gave a, we're given a priority list and set, gave our marching order, so to speak. And we had 20 plus projects that just specifically worked on security. Um, our first um, important activity, tier one, was the uh, single point of entry. Uh, these are the 12 sites that we have gone into and remodeled or refurbished their entrances to be, have lobbies very similar to what y'all have been providing for design for the last 14 years at our new schools, where you come into a single point of entrance for the school, you come into a foyer or lobby area, you are greeted, and you can go no further until you have passed that point of entrance. You just don't have free access to walk around. Um, again, every school that we've designed since 2004 has had this, and these are the places that we felt were most important to add those two to our older design schools. 
Um, each one of those sites have, is, going, is getting um, doors, buzzers, everything they need to bring that enhancement and signage so that people can see this is where you go in at. It's obvious that they need some direction on that. The second biggest um, emphasis for this summer was some fencing enhancements. Uh, these eight sites only represent the major uh, fencing enhancements. There was many minor um, repairs, replacements, small. In fact, uh, a person from the community came up to me while I was view reviewing a site and pointed out something that we added in because they were right. It was something that you, we walked by, you would miss. But many eyes can bring things to a good point to us. And we, we, we instituted that at White City. Um, and finally, I would just like to thank you all because because of your um, forward thinking in the past, there really wasn't that much to do. I mean, these schools have, have had um, a great much of attention in the last five years. We're fencing, like I said, 14 years in design. We all kind of knew exactly where to go and what to do. But because of your direction and your support and the forward thinking of y'all, we're ahead of the scale. We have been going to different meetings and looking for many, many different ideas from many different districts, and we tell them our, the things we're involved with, and they're amazed at how forward and uh, above the curve that we are. And that's because of you guys, and I appreciate it, and I thank you. That completes, that completes this portion. Um, we, we don't have enough time for Dr. Wild to come up because we do need to do an executive session and give you all a break before our five o'clock. Um, but what she was going to present on is, is just as important was going to be our, um, our plan with our uh, kindergarten through third grade regarding our, um, our um, um, literacy and, and those kinds of things. And she can share that information with you and we can get the, um, the PowerPoint to you. And then uh, she'll come back at our next work session in a month and, and, and it'll be a comprehensive, not only ELA, it'll be mathematics and science. So it'll, it'll, it'll really encompass the entire uh, curriculum. I wasn't sure if we'd have enough time today, but I, I felt like this was really important for the board members and for our public to, uh, to make sure that we had accurate information going on. Uh, for the public, we'll do an executive session down the hall here, which is just for the school board members and the board attorney and select staff, and then we'll come back and do our trim notice meeting at 5.01. All right, we need to have a vote on the um, Greater Florida Consortium consensus. And I've placed that in front of each of you. The position of the consortium is in alliance with the Florida School Board Association position on Amendment 8, and that is in opposition to Amendment 8 um, for various and sundry reasons that Vern had pointed out when he was here. Um, we do need a vote, though, of whether to be in consensus with op um, opposing Amendment 8 going forward. So, may I have a motion on uh, the... Uh, Amendment 8 going forward with the Greater Florida Consortium, Consortium of School Boards. So moved. So moved by Mr. Ingersoll. Second. Second by Ms. Hilson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We will now adjourn for our executive session.